This is House Ways and Means on May 14th. Um, and the subject this morning is education finance broadly. Um, we have, in addition to the committee, um, uh, Katie Toll is here uh, on behalf of the Appropriations Committee and both Kate Webb and Larry Cooperly are here from the Education Committee. Um, and we have invited uh, Dan French, who I see is here, um, and Adam Gresham is here, and I don't yet see Craig Bolio, but I believe that he's also going to be joining us. And what I'm hoping to do this morning is um, have a discussion um, with the legislators here, including the, the uh, non Ways and Means Committee people um, of education finance and, and sort of attempt to um, share ideas and information uh, with the administration, which um, I said before, I know has been sort of busy putting out a lot of fires up until now, but uh, really hope to have them engaged in this discussion on how we are gonna go ahead um, with education finance. So um, before, I'm gonna begin um, with uh, Mark has got a couple of documents I'd like him to present to us just to set the table from our perspective from anyway. And um, I, before I do that, let me just see if anybody has any comments that they want to make. Um, I guess I'd look to both uh, Katie and to Kate to see if you have a, a word or two that you'd like to share. Do you want me to start? Um, we're, we're working through our own budget with the general fund and the special funds, and we're seeing the same type of uh, pressure. Uh, the education fund obviously has a good deal of pressure, and as we do our work, it's going to be influenced by the work that's done in education and in ways and means. And so I am here mostly just to listen and uh, learn about alternatives uh, for the education fund. Um, but I, I am anxious to see where we're going to go to resolve these issues. And, and so for me today, it's really a learning exercise to hear more about what your committee is thinking, but also to learn the direction uh, that the administration would like to take to address this, this challenging time within these revenue funds, especially the ones that educate our children. Thanks, Kitty. How about you, Kate? I think uh, we here are also interested in hearing the discussion and the progress that you're making on addressing a rather large hole in the education fund going forward compared to what we had anticipated spending and looking for an equitable and fair way uh, to distribute um, the unallocated funds um, in a way that that's going to help our students as they're returning to school. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you want to go ahead? I know you've got a couple of documents um, and um, we'll, that's where we'll start and then we'll switch to uh, members of the administration. Good morning, everybody. Um, Sorsha, could you pop up the, uh, the education fund outlook first? Hey, can everybody see that and hear me okay? Yes? Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through um, an education fund outlook. Um, I know this this will be, some of you have been through part of this before, others of you haven't. So I'll, I'll walk through it fairly slowly and I'm gonna cover where we think we are in FY20 and then show you three scenarios in FY21 that'll give you a sense of what the problem is. And then I have a, a one page of it outlines one of the potential um, ways to deal with this is addressed using some CRF monies. So um, starting with FY20, which is this column over here on the left, um, Ways and Means members will remember that uh, prior to COVID-19 um, outbreak, um, FY20 was actually in pretty good shape. We had a full um, stabilization reserve, a full 5% stabilization reserve with uh, $37 million in it. And we also had a $12.9 million surplus uh, we, that we were expecting to end the year in. Um, subsequent to COVID-19 outbreak, we had a revenue downgrade of uh, $54.1 million in FY20. 
that was solely attributable to the um, non-property tax monies that come into the education fund, primarily the sales tax. That $54 million revenue downgrade wiped out the $12.9 million surplus and the um, stabilization reserve. And there was a little, even a little bit left over, a $3.7 million deficit, which is going to carry forward into FY21. So, can, Sorsha, can you page down to the bottom of this sheet? And I can just show people this on the sheet. So, um, you can see down here on line 27, um, current year stabilization reserve is actually in the hole. So no stabilization reserve, no surplus left, and we're down to 3.7 million deficit, which will carry forward into FY21. That's these lines here for the prior, for the prior year stabilization reserve that we have to make up in FY21. So um, and can you page back up? So for FY21, I've got three scenarios to sort of show you what's going on. The first column, right? I guess you can't see my cursor. The first, uh, the second column on this page, which is labeled current law tax rates, assumes that everything goes forward as normal under current law based on an additional um, $113 million um, downgrade compared to January in the non-property tax revenues. Um, and a $74 million increase in voter, voter approved spending. So with those two pieces in place, if everything were as normal, and um, what happens normally is everything in the education fund gets set, including the spending and the non-property tax revenues, and then the gap in the education fund is then filled by adjusting the tax rates. So in this scenario, it assumes that there's a full reserve in FY21 of $38 million, that we've reflected the $113 million downgrade in revenues, and we've left education spending um, where voters approved it, which is a $74 million increase. When we put all that in, and Chloe does her magic with the calculating the tax rates, you can see up at the sheet that we would have a really significant increase in both the homestead and non-homestead property tax rates, basically 21. Pay the 299, right? Um, so I think that might be Scott. Is that a question? No, I, I think it, um, I think somebody was just unmuted. Okay. So anyway, so you can see that there's a really substantial tax rate increase built into this scenario, 22 or 23 cents for homestead and non-homestead property taxpayers. Um, that's the, that would be the biggest increase I'd ever seen. So that, that is just, nobody wants to be there. That was, that's just to illustrate what the problem is. So then if we move over to the next column, which is the pre-COVID-19 rates, part of the reason I went over FY20 is um, Ways and Means Committee, I think, is in general agreement that for FY21, they would like to see the tax rates set where they were anticipated to be prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. So the difference between the December 1 tax rates and these tax rates is that these, this, this tax rate right here, this 154.2 and this 1628 reflect the fact that school districts reduced their spending from where it was initially um, anticipated to be, I think 5% down to about 4.2. Um, and um, what was the other part of it? Um, well, there was some additional money came in, I think, not a lot, but uh, maybe some money on the, um, uh, oh, I can't remember what they're called, but. Um, Point two, uh, six. On the oh. sources, I think there was some adjustment yeah, on no, Medicaid yeah, transfer. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was just blanking. Sorry, <laughs> it's the it's a twelve point nine million dollar surplus and the twelve point available at that time. So right. the reduction in spending plus the availability of that twelve point nine million dollar surplus yeah. um, meant that prior to COVID nineteen outbreak, these are where the tax rates. These are where the House Ways and Means Committee would have been setting the tax rates. So. For this run, we've set them at, at that level. And so if you can page down to the bottom of the screen, you can see that all the way down. Yeah, you can see that that would leave the education fund about $167 million in the hole. So the difference between the two columns I've just shown you are, one keeps the tax rates at their pre-COVID-19 level and it would result in $167 million shortfall. The, the prior column shows you what would happen if we made up that shortfall simply by increasing property tax rates, which is what we would normally do under current law. 
<laughs> Everybody with me? Clear on that. I just want to make sure everybody's sort of with us. Okay. It's a lot of information, so um, it is. slow okay. me down or ask questions if necessary. So um, column three um, represents just one example of what we've been um, looking at and kicking around ideas about how we might be able to close this gap. And the, the background here is that the state got a substantial amount of CRF monies, um, 1.25 billion statewide, that could be um, used for addressing um, problems that are, have arisen with COVID-19. However, it cannot be used to backfill lost revenues, which is a real handcuff in terms of trying to address any of these problems. If that money could be, was more flexible, we could just put it into the education fund and solve this problem with that money. But it's pretty clear from the CRF guidelines that um, that would not be a permissible use of those monies. So we've been trying to figure out um, how we might be able to work around those restrictions and still use some of this CRF money um, to close the, the gap in the, in the fund here. So in this column, first of all, what we've done is we've assumed that the tax rates would be where they would have been prior to COVID-19. So that those, those tax rates are the same. Um, can you put page down a little bit, Sorsha? All the way down. And I think I'm just trying to see if there's a reserve in here. Yes, and um, it's assumed that the reserve would not be fully restored in one year. This particular example left $15.2 million in the stabilization reserve, which is about 2% compared to the 5% we would normally have. So that's significantly short of the $38 million that we would normally have, but um, it's something in here. Um, and then can you page back up a little bit, Sorsha? Uh, so what's happened here is um, we've done on line 11, which is the education payment, which is the lion's share of the appropriations, we've assumed that even though voters have approved this $14.895 million in education spending, that we could basically um, claw back a portion of that money. In this example, it's about 5% of the total, and then use the CRF money to backfill um, the difference for districts so that districts were held harmless and the education fund would end up being balanced or you know, close to balance in this case with the 2% reserve. So um, I, have a, I have another sheet that goes over this last proposal in a little bit more detail, so it might be easier to follow, but um, are there any questions before we move off of the outlook? I don't see nope. any. See um, okay. No, I, um, before you move on to the next sheet though, I, I wanna, I should have mentioned earlier that uh, very late, we invited uh, Jeff Francis and Sue Siglowski and Jeff Fannin to join us this morning. They obviously, because I, I wasn't exactly sure how this was gonna come together. So the invitation went out late and they had conflicts but they will be watching the video is my understanding. And we've been trying to work with them on this idea that Mark is gonna talk about and sort of um, general outline. So they're familiar with it and um, Mark, I haven't met with them, but Mark has. Uh, George. Um, yeah, thank you. Mark, in the last column, Yes. where you have on line 27, a stabilization reserve of 15.2 million. Yes. Seems like kind of a random number. Where did that come from? Um, it, this is just an example we used. Um, the idea was that you might not want to take the stabilization reserve down to zero, but that's something we can, we can discuss in the proposal. I mean, there are, the last thing I think I, I'm going to touch on after walking through this one pager is what monies are available to close this gap and that $15.2 million that's still in the stabilization reserve in this example could potentially be used to close to close the gap if you were willing to let the stabilization reserve go down to nothing. So um, it, there's, not, there's nothing significant about it. This is just an example. Hi, George. This is Chloe Wexler as well. Just um, that the 15.2 is is filling the reserve to 2%. So it's, it's not totally, I mean, it is random, but it's 2%. <laughs> The idea being that maybe you do a, um, a, a you you slowly rebuild the reserve over time. So two percent is the <clears throat> choice. Yeah, it's just it's, yeah, it's just right. It, these these are all really placeholders. This is just an example to try to illustrate the idea and how we might go forward. 
Um, the one other thing I want I want to mention before we move off of the education fund outlook is that we th this is um, FY20 was a consensus revenue forecast and FY21 was not. Um, it was def just um, Tom Kovett's um, estimate. So my understanding is um, by Friday of this week, we should have a consensus revenue forecast for both FY20, FY21, and FY22. And so, Friday is tomorrow, right? Oh, is that right? Is that, I lost track of the days. <laughs> okay. I think so. <laughs> All right. So, yes. Yeah. Um, so, they'll be coming out then. So, okay. So, um, if, if everybody's so far, Every estimate that we've done, we the numbers have improved slightly. Um, yes. So, we don't know that that's true, but, um, but these numbers are based on a non consensus uh, forecast. Right. And, you know, and there's the, the other caveats we've talked about before, and they're sort of getting lost, but um, this, um, this assumes that some of the deferred uh, sales tax and meals and rooms tax is going to be fully collected and remitted to the Ed Fund. Um, that's an open question. It's only about, it says 41 on here. That's a mistake. I haven't updated that. It really should be 20 million. So there's a $20 million risk out there if, the, if that doesn't come in. And again, this doesn't reflect any use of um, the ESSER money, the $27 million um, that's yes. available. So I'm going to talk about that. So that, that's not reflected in here as well. Yep. So there's going to be ways to chip away at this. This yep. particular example just shows you how, the, how we may chip away at it with the uh, CRF funds. Yep. So, uh, Sorsha, can you pop up the uh, Word document? Emily, do you have a question before we go on? I do. Sorry, it took me a second to find my participant list when we were all um, sharing screen with the sharing screen. I just want to um, make sure I'm understanding. There's still a hole in this scenario of 50 something. Yeah, I should have touched okay. on that. That's right. This, this, okay. doesn't, this doesn't completely solve the problem. Um, it, it, it shows you what happens if we were to basically claw back 5% of the property at the education payment. And you could pick up different mods. It doesn't look like we have any problems with maintenance of effort provisions that are in there. So we could take down that education payment further. It's just a question of how much um, how much of that money that we're, we'd be able to replace with uh, CRF money or ESSER monies or some other sort. Okay, thank there you. Is, there is almost a $70, $70 million hole in the fund still, even under this scenario, you're right. But, but what you've done, Mark, is you really helped us see where the variables are, which is, yeah, hope, which is what so, we... Yeah. Yep. You know, we can peg them anywhere we want. Just so people know, I just got a note from Steve Klein, who must be watching, that um, the estimate is going to be next Tuesday. Tuesday? Okay. okay. Yeah. Real-time update here. Okay. Okay, so, um, Sorsha, can you put up the uh, Word document? So um, again, this is this is kind of a, a general description of an idea um, for potentially using um, some of the CRF monies. Um, once I'm through this, and I, you know, there there are other ways that we've been trying to kick, kick this around and think of other ways to do it. But this is one scenario, and you'll get the idea, I think, of what we're trying to do by walking through here. So um, step number one is to set the normal tax rates, which we've already talked about. Those are the tax rates that the Ways and Means Committee were, was looking at prior to COVID-19. Um, in that FY21 column, that 154.2 and the 162.8, um, that's where those tax rates would be. And that would represent a, about a three to three and a half cent increase, okay, even at those rates. And that, br that brings in about $60.4 million into the, into the uh, education fund. Not nearly enough to fill that hole that we've identified, but it is bringing in some additional money. The second step would be to distribute um, to schools um, the state's allocation of the ESSER funds. And uh, the total amount, I think, was around $31 million. Um, the agency would be able to retain about 10% of this. And the remainder of it would go out to um, supervisory unions. Uh, I'm not sure exactly at this point how, what plans are for using this money. But um, one, of the, one of the uses for it could be to offset some of the whole um, in the education fund that we've identified. And the one thing about um, this ESSER, these ESSER funds are is that it's, a, it's got a much um, more lenient um, guidelines as to how the monies can be used. Um, when I look at the guidelines, to me, it looks like it could be used for almost anything. So in some sense, you know, you can conflate this and put the CRF and the ESSER money together. I like to think about them separately because I think that it may be possible to use them differently because the ESSER money is much more flexible than the CRF money. And this is the money that we talked about on Tuesday when yes. the secretary was with us. Yep. Um, step three would be to an appropriate um, 
and as yet to be determined portion of that $1.25 billion that the states received in the CRF funds. And um, well, it's the recent, yeah, where am I? Yeah, and, and set up a fund in the Agency of Education. So you would take some portion of that $1.25 billion, appropriate it to the Agency of Education for distribution to school districts to backfill some of the money that we're going to pull back from them. So step four is the pullback part. It's the in FY21, we've reduced the education payment to school districts, again, by a yet to be determined amount, a uniform percentage that falls within the, the maintenance of effort guidelines. And actually, I think that that's an error. I don't think, um, I've, we've done some more work and we've looked around. I don't think that the CRF money has any maintenance of effort requirements in it. So, so yeah, it's weird. I think that you'll see at the bottom of the sheet what the requirements are, but um, there may not be a maintenance of effort part in there. Um, in March, voters approved about 1.5 billion uh, million dollars. Yeah, was that billion? Yeah, 1.5 billion um, in education spending. So every 1% reduction in the education payment would um, save about 14.9 million dollars statewide. And, and again, the idea would be that would be a savings for the education fund, but it would districts would be basically held harmless. Um, step five would be to set up have you know the, the money that AOE gets would be put into a fund that would allow AOE to provide grants to school districts for eligible spending um, that could be um, backfilled with this CRF aid up to, a, up to an amount that the education payment has been reduced. Um, that's what we've been doing a lot of work on because it's difficult um, to identify where we have um, such a diffuse system. It's difficult for us to be able to identify how much of the budgeted spending for FY21 may fit within the guidelines um, to be eligible under the CRF money. One example that has come up that I think may, may have legs is, for example, I think school districts were required to pay all their staff even after schools closed down. And in many cases, those teachers are working. But my understanding is there are some cases in which those teachers have not been able to continue to work for whatever reason. Those teacher salaries may be something that you could use CRF money to backfill the cost of. But th this, is the, this is the hardest part of this and it's what we're working on. And just to give you an idea, a little better idea why it's difficult. Can you page down just a little bit more, Sorja? So the, the US Treasury gu guidance is okay in terms of us taking the CRF money and allocating it to sub um, subunits of government. So no problem with appropriating it to AOE and having them distribute it to the school districts. But any of the money that's covered with the CRF funds has to be eligible. So it has to be a necessary expenditure occurred due to COVID-19. Um, and we've gone through the guidelines. There's been, there's been one major guideline issue and a couple of um, frequently asked questions that have come out that actually seem to make it tighter as they've gone forward. So um, there's an open question as to whether or not you can identify enough existing spending or budgeted spending to make this worthwhile to do um, because it would require um, a lot of administrative work because both for the districts and for AOE this district would have to apply for it. AOE would have to identify, have to agree that it's a COVID-19 eligible expenditure, and then the money would have to go back to the district. So it's it's not elegant. It would be much simpler if we could just put the money into the fund or just direct the money back to the school districts. But given the guidance that I've seen so far, I don't think that that's going to be a possibility. Um, there are some other ideas uh, floating around that um, we may be able to use, for example, um, simply a categorical grant that would be, uh, that would be paid on a per pupil basis back to schools to reduce some of this cost and to use CRF funds. And the justification would be that under administrative simplification, we can't you know, do this down to the penny in terms of making the um, money that's going out match COVID-19 related costs per district. Um, I don't know whether that's a possibility or not, but that's what we're continuing to work on. Um, the chair mentioned that we had a meeting um, a couple of days ago with the um, school superintendents association and some super some superintendents to get them to start thinking about this and um, asking for their help and trying to identify costs within their budgets that they think might meet the criteria. Yeah. So. Good. 
Um, so I'm going to uh, get clarifying questions. I don't want to debate the proposal right now because I want to. We've invited the administration to be here with us, and I want to give them a chance to talk about their ideas. But I see Emily and Kitty, and then um, and then just make sure that people understand what Mark's put on the table. Yeah, Emily. I I think you're. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll wait. Thanks. I'm sorry, you're waiting. Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Kitty. Thank you, Janet. I think this is a clarifying question and Mark, you may not have the answer to it, but can you just on the surface of things, do we feel that there's systems in place that we could turn around this proposal and get the information back that is needed to determine what's COVID, what's not COVID, COVID uh, so that if and when, if when an audit is done, that, that what we receive from the school districts actually meet the criteria so that we don't end up with a hole in the end. I just don't know what systems are in place from school to school to school to get all this information quickly to um, DOE. And, and maybe yeah. there, I just don't know that answer. Yeah, and I, I, I don't really know, but I, I think when I was thinking about this proposal, um, I was thinking that we wouldn't have to do that in advance. So, you know, we, we, in other words, we would take down the education payment by a certain percentage and then allow districts to apply for that money. If a district couldn't identify enough money to make up for that loss, then that would show up in their budget as a, they would have to find money within their existing budget to cut. They would have to use reserves or they would have to run a deficit forward into FY21. I don't think given the time we have, we're gonna be able to identify all of the spending that might be eligible. We're trying to find out we're trying to get a ballpark number to find out if it's even worth doing it because if, if there's no money out there for them to do this, it would be you know, not, not a valuable exercise to go. An awful lot of work for not much. A lot of work for not a lot of money, um, and I think that's that's why we did not on the on the example I showed you on the balance sheet, we didn't assume that this is a mechanism that's going to solve the entire problem. We're thinking about it as a piece of a broader proposal that incorporates a lot of different money from different sources to close that hole. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Um, just just want to clarify that I understand the options that you're talking about. You're looking at a property tax um, increase of about three percent for both homestead and non-homestead. Three cents. Yeah. Three cents. Yes. Excuse me. Um, using COVID nineteen money, the currently the thirty million that's available, uh, that's more flexible. Using CRF money potentially, which needs there's more accountability required then clawing, in a sense, for lack of a better word, clawing back from the districts to make up for the money that they're they're getting from the COVID money and then allowing uh, districts to apply for, for grants. Is that, have I got this or not? And, and yes, and drawing down a little bit of money that's enough, not a little bit, drawing, drawing down the stabilization reserve. It, right. To $15 million. Yeah, all those pieces. And you still have a $70 million hole left, so. I think, though, on your spreadsheet, that that far right column doesn't mm -hmm. include the twenty seven million. It does not. Right. So that so you would if we were to do that, that would be subtracted off the. If, if, that, money, yeah, if that money could be used yeah. for this purpose. Yes. Yeah. So that's a but but Kate, you're right. Those are sort of the the variables that we've, we've got in front of us. Um, other other questions. Um, so, so the work that Mark is doing is, in the, and with the committee is still evolving, still developing. Um, and so I'm not, certainly not expecting people to um, say that they're ready to do it or that they don't want to do it at this point. Um, I think given the discussions we've had in the committee, it's one of the more, it's sort of what's left on the table that may allow us to get some federal money into the, into the, um, into the school finance system. Um, so we'll continue to explore this and we'll continue to explore other ideas as they, as they come up. Um, but uh, Robin, and then I'm gonna switch to Adam. Just a quick question and yeah. I don't know who would know about this, but I heard something uh, on the news a couple of days ago that rather than do a new package, um, you know, COVID four or whatever the bill is five, uh, that there's some talk in Washington about relaxing the restrictions on this particular bill, which is so prescriptive right now that 
states can't use it. And um, I wonder if anybody's heard anything or Mark, if you've heard anything more about that at this point. I haven't heard anything more. I mean, there's been talk about a COVID-4, but the latest I've read on that is not to expect anything before like the end of June, which may be too late for us to be dealing with this stuff. Um, I hadn't heard that they were talking about more flexibility with the existing CRF money, but that would that would help a lot. And we could craft a much more elegant um, way to close this gap if it was. On the other hand, this, this, um, if, if we created this fund in the Agency of Education and we left some flexibility and it turned out that this was more flexible money, maybe, we, maybe that gives us the mechanism to get it out to the schools. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, late in the day, I'm looking at uh, Dan French who has to administer this, but, right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, just a thought. So and we, 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 we yeah. also jump in, we, we may also have a, a much better idea about the potential for this. Um, the school superintendents associations agreed to, I think, survey the, their members um, right. and with a list of questions that would um, ask them to reply um, to any, what to, if, if they think of, if they can identify any expenditures that would qualify for this, and there's a list of things that we think might be possibilities that they could respond to. So we would have an idea. Great. Hey, thank you. I know that there's a thousand questions. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting it off because we, because we asked the administration to come in and I want to be sure that their thoughts are also in front of us. Um, but, um, but we will, we'll have plenty of time to do all the questions that we need to do. Um, I'm looking at Adam and Dan French and Craig Bolio, and I don't know what order you all want to go in. So just somebody tell me how you would like to do this. Uh, I am uh, happy to tee it up, Madam okay. Chair, if uh, it suits the committee. Fine. Okay. Um, anyway, thank you for inviting us to speak uh, to your committee. This. This should be fun. And uh, a thank you to uh, Joint Fiscal Office, Mark Perot, for the uh, discussion earlier. I guess if you've got a thousand questions teed up, uh, I'm here to add to that uh, questions teed up. But you, uh, you know, just to uh, start it off, I, you know, I would say that um, you've asked the budget guy to share ideas. So as the budget guy, I think, tend to think in budget terms. And by that, I mean, if faced with this challenge in the work that I do for uh, the general fund or the transportation fund, what would I do? So that's kind of the way I'm approaching this. And in that regard, I've enclosed uh, for your reading pleasure at a future time, the budget instructions that my office sent out Tuesday evening. I think those are posted uh, and, at this point. I, th I think we posted them. Okay, good. So uh, for, for those of you who had the chance to peruse them, um, you know, the instructions will give you an idea of where I'm going. I would note in there um, that there, we do mention the education fund and we assume that the education fund for first quarter of FY21 would be funded at 30%. Uh, that is meant to comport with the kind of three education payments that go out roughly a third, a third, a third. Uh, so that is, is not meant to change what is current practice. I didn't want to uh, confuse anyone there. But, you know, for context and in looking at those instructions, I would say that, so I submitted an FY21 budget on behalf of the governor in January, and we used the revenue estimates that were adopted by the e-board in January, which is what we currently do. Um, that was the most current information available. And come April, uh, maybe uh, come uh, mid-March, uh, we all knew that those revenue estimates and, in fact, the budget that I submitted on behalf of the governor were obsolete. Thus, the budget instructions you see before you that are based on more updated revenue estimates. And we're asking in those instructions, we're asking departments and agencies to submit to us a first quarter budget that spends 23% of a full 20 budget uh, during the first quarter of fiscal 21. And um, by kind of another way to say that is that um, if 
departments and most departments will spend their budget kind of a quarter, another quarter, you know, in a relatively even format. So what we're saying to them is normally you'd spend 25% of your budget in the first quarter. Instead, please spend 23% of what the FY20 spend was. So annualized, that would be um, 2% a quarter or a total of an 8% reduction over the year from the FY20 level. And you know, keep in mind, based on a revenue estimate that we have um, that forecasts a 15% drop in revenue over FY21. So we're not being particularly severe um, in our ask to departments and agencies, but we are acknowledging that um, it's early yet and um, we're trying to do this um, in a pretty quick pace. So with the legislature's approval, we're hoping to lock in this Q1, what we're calling a skinny budget, and then come back in a few months when the picture is more clear and adopt a full fiscal 21 budget. You know, this committee uh, would agree that this is a responsible path given the circumstances. So, you know, what I would say is, you know, in many ways, uh, in fact, in most ways, school budgets are in fact, they, they follow a, a, a similar process in that school boards work on them in the fall, which is when the governors uh, and the administration work on uh, the uh, budget for the state. Um, school boards use the tax commissioner's December 1st letter as guidance on the likely tax implications of their work, and they vote their budgets in January, put them before voters in early March, at town meeting day. And in, in virtually all cases, the information used to construct those budgets before voters is accurate, in, in that the tax commissioner is using information that he has at his disposal at that time. Um, there are changes, as this committee knows, and sometimes, you know, the, that uh, requires some adjustment to uh, tax rates, but the changes uh, in almost all cases are very minor. And you know, I think we would all agree that that's not the case this year. And I think the tax consequences of the approved budgets are radically different from what they were when voters went to town meeting. Uh, and I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb to suggest that the uh, budget votes would have been different or the budgets themselves would have been different if voters knew then what we know now. And you know, I'm aware this committee has spent significant time trying to find ways to adjust revenues to take the edge off the tax consequences of voted budgets. And you know, I know you've come up with some good ideas worth pursuing, uh, some of which we heard this morning. We've done the same in the administration. But you know, I'm also here to say that looking at revenues alone, you know, I, I simply, it's just not the answer. You know, the gap is too wide and I get it. You guys are the revenue committee and that's the lever you have. Um, but again, as you know, the budget guy, I would say that I just see no way of avoiding looking at the spending side. I, I just think you, you, we have to consider that too, which in, um, leaves really two broad options. Um, if we are going to consider the spending side. And, and, you know, I recognize each of these would require some statutory uh, adaptation or statutory changes. First, you know, as Commissioner of Finance, I could set the education payment. Um, you know, that would have the state for FY21 determine what we will send to districts. Um, and, you know, that's the model that's used in many states in one form or another. Um, I know it's not used in ours. Um, but that is uh, one possibility. Or uh, I would suggest the more democratic approach and, and one more aligned with Vermont's system of local control over uh, education spending is we could ask districts to revote their budgets later in the summer, as the state is going to do with the general fund once the dust settles and we have a better handle on the revenue picture and frankly, the allowable uses for the uh, coronavirus relief fund. And you know, using the skinny budget model that you see in our budget instructions, we could adopt or mandate a Q1 budget similar to last year's Q1 spending levels to get through the summer. And then districts could lock in a full year budget late summer or early fall. 
And the tax commissioner could provide an updated letter and district school boards and voters could go to the polls with uh, eyes wide open. So I, I'm not suggesting that anything I've said is easy or ideal. Um, these are extraordinary times and they call for extraordinary measures. Um, but at a minimum, I am suggesting that we can't go on viewing this from a revenue perspective alone. And I'm confident that Vermonters will understand the challenges we face. And I think they'll appreciate the initiative to let them uh, participate in the solution. So uh, Madam Chair, there you have uh, the first uh, suggestion and something the administration believes we should consider. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I suspect there might be some questions once people absorb what you've said. Um, George. Um, thank you, Adam. Presentation. So the, the CRF money, the 1.25 billion, um, do you know how much statewide we have identified as COVID expenses um, to be that which could be covered with that money? Uh, so far, we've identified in terms of expenses we have already incurred or expenses that we have more or less obligated roughly 170 million or so. And are, but are there other anticipated expenditures which would qualify for use that money to be covered? I think, uh, yes, uh, we haven't come forward with uh, a list of our um, suggestions, nor uh, am I aware that the legislature has. I know there's been in the budget adjustment a few uh, suggestions here and there, but I don't think in any case uh, there's been anything that would go that would be more than in total something like two hundred million dollars. And are you in agreement that uh, with the analysis that we've heard that we cannot um, use this money directly to go to the education fund or to the towns for education for property taxes or that don't come in? Does the administration agree with those analyses? Uh, we are, uh, I suspect as others, we're looking very carefully at the language. Uh, we have not come up with a fail-safe way to um, make us comfortable that uh, the coronavirus relief fund language or funds could be used uh, in the education fund hopefully for uh, more than a few education expenses. That's not to say that's not the case, but it is the, to say that we're not convinced that uh, there's uh, an easy way to get that money in. And, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, I, I also want to acknowledge we're looking at this very seriously because, you know, the state is the grantee. And if we do, for example, as we heard earlier, uh, sub-grant this money to districts, um, we ultimately, um, are on the, uh, you know, it's ultimately our responsibility to make sure that it's spent wisely. And then the last question is, do you have, does the administration have any more information um, than, than we do about the COVID-4 or relaxation of the, um, the requirements of use around the utilization of the COVID-3 money? I know that in legislation that was um, drafted by um, uh, the, the US Congress that there is one stipulation in there that would allow far uh, more liberal uses of the money. Um, but where that stands um, to get through the full Congress, I don't know. But I know that there's virtually every state, Vermont included, has asked for uh, greater uh, lenience with the use of that money. And virtually every state has received the same answer of no, but, um, you know, there's always a chance. You all set, George? Uh, Robin and Jim. Thank you. Um, Adam, your notion of asking the districts to rewrote their budgets, um, you know, about 75% of them 
the cost of budgets is uh, probably locked up. And how would this work with contracts with teachers and staff? I might uh, call on my colleague, uh, Secretary French, who's probably more uh, equipped to deal with that question. Good morning. It's a great question. Uh, we're not hearing you at all. Um, if you if you sh turn off your video, um, we might be able to. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. okay. There's a, had a Bluetooth issue there, so I'm just going to. Uh, uh, thanks. Okay. The um, yeah, the complexity of how that would play out is is not so clear. I guess that's um, to Adam's point about putting that in the context of local decision makers, and one could expect um, those dynamics to be sorted out locally uh, based on how each district, uh, their contract scenario at the moment. We know uh, up to a few weeks ago, there were a large number of teacher contracts in particular that were uh, not settled. I, I imagine many of them have been settled subsequently, um, but that would, you know, this, this kind of context would, would no doubt um, force locals to come to the table and to, to find the problems based on their context. Um, I, I won't not clear what your answer was. Is, is the existence of the contracts a significant issue in terms of revoting? Well, as you know, 80% of the costs are personnel related. Um, so I, I don't think uh, districts would be able to navigate the issue easily without um, getting all stakeholders on the table to come up with a solution. Uh, Jim, Emily, and Kate, I think. Yep. <clears throat> Adam, hi, how are you? <laughs> nice um, to see you, Jim. Okay. Um, in your last little paragraph or so, um, before George's question, you were indicating a couple of things that I'm not sure about. One is it sounded like you've identified some uses for the COVID money already. And it, it sounded as if, according to your work through, that much of the money is encumbered or at least allocated somewhere already. Is that so? I mean, where I'm going is if, if we followed that logic, what would be left for education if we could use it for education? No, I, I may not have been clear. Uh, we've, um, in the emergency response, <clears throat> in the governor's initial month or two, um, he needed to uh, stand up the emergency operations center, the health operations center. We needed to purchase um, equipment and, and gear and the like. That in total um, has um, encumbered, I would say, about uh, $170 million. Um, but there's, you know, that leaves the remaining over $1 billion that we have not encumbered. Um, I wasn't sure what you meant, but thank you. Uh, Emily. Thanks. Hi, Adam. Um, I am hesitant to get into the spending versus, versus revenue conversation, um, but you opened it up, and so I'm going to step into it a little bit. Um, when I look across state government, I imagine, um, including the educational system, I imagine that spending needs would be quite different um, in the context of COVID from one department to another. Some departments would have much higher sort of COVID related needs and would have a much higher need for spending um, above and beyond what we might have even expected without this. Um, and I see the education system as one particular place that that's gonna play itself out. What's fortunate is that it seems like the opportunities for revenue related to COVID are also much more increased in departments um, or sp locations that have those needs because that's what the federal money is for. And so I'm trying to understand better how you're asking um, the departments that you're working with to accommodate that increased need, um, which you will have an increased possibility for spending. Cause I'm thinking maybe we could apply that same framework to the ed fund. That was a little circular. I'm hoping you followed it. Um, we have asked departments that have needs that they believe uh, are COVID related to represent them to us, uh, to code them in their expenses um, appropriately. 
And then our intention is to um, reimburse them with COVID money, uh, subject obviously to the budget process. Um, but uh, so we've asked departments to uh, let us know what their what their needs are. And our intentions, um, again, subject to the budget process will be to uh, reimburse them with COVID money. And so you're keeping that sort of almost out of the budgeting process, is that what you're saying? But allow uh, no, we, we anticipate that would be part of the budget process as it always okay. is. Okay. In other words, the COVID money will need to be appropriated going forward. So uh, anything that we um, uh, would spend of that fund uh, as well as general fund and so on will be part of the normal budgeting process. Are you all set, Emily? Mm -hmm. So I have a question. Um, if is the purpose behind, so as I understand your proposal, it's to have the tax commissioner do an updated letter and then have districts revote their budgets, but sort of wipe out whatever decisions were made in March and basically say you need to you need to vote again um, to set a budget. And I, I realize there's a uh, transition issue, but that's essentially the proposal. Yes, and it would have districts adopt a, a so-called skinny budget, a Q1 budget. Um, to get them through the summer because they will need uh, the authority to spend money, um, but yes. So um, I guess, the, so the question I have is the purpose behind that to reduce education spending um, or is it uh, to figure out a way to uh, solve the problem that we have and <clears throat> the reason I'm asking the question is if, if we suddenly got the flexibility to put, you know, 160 million or whatever the number is that we're looking for of federal money into the education fund, if that was, if US Treasury and Congress says, yes, we're, we're good with you all doing that. Um, would, would you support our doing that? Or, or are you, do you, um, do you have as a goal um, reducing education spending? that would take precedence over using that federal money that way? Well, we have, uh, I would say two goals. Uh, the first goal, uh, put simply, um, is to um, extend the time period, essentially to buy time uh, while the dust settles on a revenue picture, uh, as well as guidance for the use of the coronavirus relief fund. So, uh, you know, until we know better, what our revenues will be in FY21. Um, and until we know better whether uh, what we uh, heard this morning about putting 5% of the coronavirus relief fund into the uh, education uh, budget, I mean, I would call that <laughs> the definition of aspirational budgeting. I mean, we don't know whether we can do that or not. So, uh, you know, until we know both what we can use the fund for and what our revenue is. Um, it's really difficult to make decisions. And the second goal is to put before voters all the information so they can make decisions on that. I mean, I'm not going to pretend that school districts are going to change their mind. Some districts may want to vote the same budget they had in March, but at least they'll know the consequences of doing that and all the revenue available at their disposal. So let me, so let me ask my question again, because I was, I asked it in a very convoluted way and I want to be really clear. If the, um, if we got uh, guidance from the US Treasury next Tuesday that said that you are okay putting as much money as you want into the education fund to make up for lost revenue, would you support our doing that? I don't think the administration uh, has dealt with that. I don't think we have a strong opinion, but I will tell you that we would certainly consider it. We're not here to stand against the, the use of the coronavirus relief fund uh, to help in education. So if we can find ways to direct federal money to the education fund, whether we do it by way of schools or to taxpayers or directly into the fund, um, you would um, be supportive of that? We are certainly considering all options, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, we're, uh, you know, again, my point is not to X out the use of that fund for education. My point is more, we're not sure what qualifies and as the, you know, grantee, we have to be absolutely certain that what qualifies uh, we use and not a penny more. Yeah, I, I, would, I would guess that absolute certainty is gonna to be tough 
um, for a lot of this money, but um, Kate and then Robin. Thank you. Um, I think in the process of being asked for ideas, we do put all ideas on the table, but that does not mean that all ideas uh, really are gonna solve the problem that we're addressing. And um, as chair of the education committee, one of the things that we are observing is the need for some kind of stability for schools going forward. We've had incredible chaos this year. We have, you know what the situation is, I'm sure you're hearing us. So um, the concept of sending voters back to, to revote budgets uh, sounds like instead of stabilizing contributes to even more chaos. Uh, looking at the 19 districts without budgets right now, the amount of chaos in those districts is palpable as they're trying to figure out how they're gonna deal with voting, what they would do if they ended up having last year's budget and needing to cut 20 teachers, 45 paraeducators, all of the sports programs and foreign languages. Those are the things that are coming up in the face of um, collective bargaining agreements. So, so I guess um, the question for you is, in considering this, are you looking at the chaos that this could create, the complexity of everybody needing to revote when it's incredibly challenging already, um, and also the cost of revoting, it, money that could be better spent, some of the, the, some of the amount that we've heard from districts, uh, the concern about spending that amount of money to vote under uh, COVID-19 conditions. Didn't mean that to be as much as uh, we are aware of the challenge of revoting. Um, but I would argue that the chaos that we have at the state level is no different than the chaos you were referring to at the local level. This, as I said earlier, these are extraordinary times and they require extraordinary measures. Um, the voting system that we have, or the, the education financing system that we have um, in front of us um, requires the state to raise whatever money uh, school districts determine they need. Uh, at the moment, we were at a curveball. Uh, we have substantially less money than we thought um, so that voters, when they went to the polls in March, were using incorrect information. Our view is that they would like better information um, and the opportunity to revote their budgets based on that better information. Like I said before, they may decide to have the exact same budget, but at least they'll know the consequences of that when they vote for it. Just, just a tag. Can I just jump in because uh, Dan French also wanted to answer that question and I was going to direct your question to him. Um, so do you mind if we get an answer from him first? Sure. No. We'll to you. Okay. No, I, I was just going to echo Adam's uh, perception on, on, on his uh, summary of the context. It is, I don't say chaotic, it's, it's been very chaotic for everyone involved. And, you know, to this point on the uncertainty uh, to the earlier question, um, there's so much uncertainty. And I was just going to uh, follow up on, on some observations Mark made, because I think it is, when we start talking about the revenue side, I think it's really useful to draw a distinction between the CRF and the ESSER uh, funds, because they have different parameters attached to them. As Mark mentioned, um, apparently there's no maintenance of effort uh, requirement with CRF, but there is a maintenance of effort with ESSER. That's one of the assurances that we've had to provide. So that that comes into play. Um, and districts have, have, you know, as we've launched into this emergency, we've been asking them to make expenditures that were not in their budgets, uh, but they've done so coding those expenses, understanding ultimately that, that they would uh, see some revenue coming in. And as that became more clear to them that um, the guidance they've sort of been navigating is the ESSER guidance, which is much more flexible than the CRF guidance. So districts have been proceeding with the understanding that they're going to have some broad flexibility with federal revenue coming in. Um, but as we we contemplate, you know, how, how the ESSER functions relative to the CRF, I think the maintenance of efforts issue, uh, but also the timing of those funds. We know ESSER has a longer trajectory than CRF. So ESSER uh, goes through December, or excuse me, um, September of 21, where my understanding of CRF is that timeline ends in December of this year. 
and we know a better part of the expenses uh, the districts will see are not necessarily the ones they've incurred from March 13th to now, uh, they're going to see significant increases in expenses related to special education and student services as the crisis winds down and we begin entering into a recovery phase. So I think, you know, when I add all that uncertainty up on the revenue side right now, um, once again, I think it points to uh, the issue to have, I won't say the skinny budget approach, but to have some time uh, by which we can um, understand and, and our system relies on voters making those decisions so that we can understand um, not only what the context is from a spending perspective, but also what the revenue perspective is, because I'm, I'm not confident right now. Uh, as much as I think it's, it's, it's useful to think about using the ESSER funds uh, to offset a liability to the ed fund and bringing in the CRF to backfill. I think those, those assumptions are going to be uh, are problematic to a certain extent because we don't know um, how much of the expenses districts have incurred uh, will qualify under the CRF. And we also don't know if um, they'll be able to qualify them in, in the finite timeline uh, that CRF requires, which is a much tighter timeline, especially considering that the bulk probably of the expenses districts will see as a result of the emergency are yet to be occurred and probably won't be uh, figured out until the uh, next school year. So all those things, you know, just to point out the, I would say the complexity or the chaos of the situation, uh, as a, my instinct as a manager then is to try to, to break that down into smaller parts and to uh, suggest that this would be a good time, as, as, as uh, Representative Webb acknowledged, this, this is a challenging dynamic in terms of engaging local decision makers, but that's, that's a better part of how our system functions. So I don't see how we avoid that, uh, particularly since even in the, in the models we've uh, looked at this morning, which are based on some assumptions of using revenue, that still leaves us with a sizable gap to address. Hey, go ahead. I interrupted you. Yeah, no, just uh, th it's very clear that um, the challenges that we're facing now may well need to be reconciled in FY22 and perhaps FY23. So, and that is a time where folks are going to have a, a whole lot more time to think about what the impacts are. Um, in addition, it's my understanding of current law that that uh, communities can already petition school boards to ask for a revote. I don't have a lawyer in the room, so. Oh, you got one. I am one. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's a time limit on the revote. Yeah, I think there, you know, the mechanics of that, I'm not a lawyer, but the boards could certainly do that under own authority. But, you know, our, our, I think our model is just coming at a high level to suggest that the understanding the legislature has broad authority um, and, and certainly it's probably going to be necessary. And I guess it's, you know, when I, when I look back on the decisions we've had to make in the last several months, um, you know, and decisions that are before us relative to the state college system, relative to our hospitals, relative to virtually every aspect of our uh, society and ec economy in Vermont. It, it, um, knowing, knowing and getting a better handle on the federal revenues is, is useful and it certainly uh, um, takes some pressure off to a certain extent, but I can't help but think that we're at a moment in history where we, the system's gonna have to evolve, meaning the K-12 system. Um, I don't understand how we could maintain the trajectory we are and in the case, uh, as Representative Webb pointed out, with master agreements where te some teachers and, and uh, employees of school districts will be receiving raises at the precise of the time where we're going to have some of the highest unemployment rates since the Great Depression, um, where education spending decisions were made based on uh, assumption six that were made six months ago. Um, I think, you know, the, the idea that two years from now or a year out from now, we can fix this as um, I'm not confident that's the case. I think we have an emergency right now and we need to, you know, as difficult as that is, we have to uh, put our best thinking on the table and try to try to move the system into a position to help it uh, navigate this emergency. Um, Robin. Thanks. Well, now I have another question before I ask the one that I was going to ask a few minutes ago. So, Secretary French, are you um, suggesting that uh, school districts need to reopen their contracts and ne renegotiate them now? I think that very well could be an eventuality, but I think that's really, you know, in respect to the local decision ma making, I would, I would defer to locals to navigate that. I know 
Um, there were a number of contracts that were open uh, up to a few weeks ago. I'm not, it's not clear to me how many of them have been settled, but certainly if they were settled, they were settled with the understanding of the COVID-19 emergency and the fiscal uncertainty of the near future and probably the longer term view. Um, so that's that certainly wouldn't surprise me um, if this context uh, puts pressure on, on locals to, to revisit those decisions. But um, I think, you know, from a state perspective, our, our, our role would be to, to just share the information so folks can make those decisions. And right now to, to pretend that folks made those budget decisions in March with a full understanding of the context, I don't think is necessarily accurate. So, um, you know, our thinking as we, as you are struggling with the various different dimensions of this problem, we're coming back to that issue that uh, if we need to share the information with the folks who have a role and a skin in the game and the decision making. Okay, so I want to go back to my thank you. I want to go back to my uh, my first question, which was um, uh, under the proposal to have the tax commissioner redo the December letter with an updated letter now, and then have districts revote the budget and follow the general fund budget of sort of doing a skinny budget and then another. I'm that works in a general fund budget, but now we're talking about. Um, uh, we're talking about towns and sending out tax bills and tax rates that are going to change partway through. And, 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 and Representative Webb talked about chaos. And I'm going to add uncertainty to that on the part of all of our, our neighbors and friends and community citizens who are suddenly, sorry, I have a lawn mowing in the back, um, who are now going to get different bills. And what are they supposed to do about that? Um, there's creating more chaos and more uncertainty and I'll mute myself. So I don't know yeah, how you're going to deal with that. Yeah, I think, but the alternative is to um, send them a 20 cent tax increase, you know, or, you know, to um, maybe embark on a use of federal revenues in a way that, that leaves us exposed later on to uh, further issues. Uh, we just don't have all the information at this point. So it's, that's, I think we're, we're starting to admire the, the true complexity of the problem in front of us and there are no easy answers. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to jump in there as well, Representative. Th that challenge of, of towns needing to bill a second time is one that we had identified as we were discussing this. Um, it's, it's a fair challenge, right? And it's, again, one of the reasons that any, any idea that's going to be presented on this topic will be imperfect. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I've heard from this committee and, and also heard this morning was just uh, everybody talking about, well, we don't know all the answers yet, right? We don't have all the guidance yet, um, which to me, I think, fits into the why don't we give ourselves a little more time, even though it will have some additional challenges that it, it lays out. Um, I do think that, um, you know, if we're talking about costs of, of rebilling and things like that, uh, those may be appropriate to use uh, some of the federal money for. We, we have to research that a little more. So, so hopefully that's one avenue of relief. But yeah, it was, it was a challenge that we identified. It's a fair one, but um, we think it's worth the cost in, in this case to be able to provide that um, or, or get better information and then provide more certainty moving forward. Um, Sam, yeah, how are you? Good morning, everyone. Um, so I've been listening to this and I'm trying to figure out what really is the timeline that you're talking about. Um, so, you know, it's kind of been traditionally, you know, we at least try and get a budget by July or June 30th so we can send out tax bills. But I want somebody to lay out the timeline for me of what, like, what, how we're going to have schools revote or school districts revote their budgets in the next month and a half and get tax rates or are we just like postponing that or we're putting in a little bit of money for the meantime somebody lay out how this is actually going to work because it seems pretty vague and it seems like time is pretty short who wants to do that well i since i kind of presented it maybe i should take first go at it and uh, secretary french can uh, reel me in if i so our feeling and was that uh, first we would, um, using the skinny budget model, um, pass legislation that would allow districts to uh, fund themselves uh, based on some, call it FY20 level of funding for the first quarter. And uh, you know, keep in mind that the, the body is already uh, talking about this for districts that haven't voted their budgets yet. 
So this would not be a topic that would be out of the norm, um, even based on conversations we've had in the past couple of months. So that would get them through the summer. And then once we have better revenue um, uh, picture, once we have better guidance uh, on the use of the coronavirus relief fund, uh, either through additional federal legislation or for additional uh, uh, guidance from the treasury with the existing legislation, uh, school districts <clears throat> can go to the polls again. I mean, they, 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 there's a primary coming up in August, right? So um, that could be a time um, that actually might get turnout for a primary. Um, but, uh, you know, there's any number of days or weeks they can choose. But my thought is kind of like the state is doing. Um, we're going to leave uh, in June, hopefully, uh, with a first quarter budget locked in, and then we're going to come back late summer uh, and deal with a full year budget. Uh, I don't see any reason why uh, districts can't do the same thing. Pam, did you get the answer you were looking for? <laughs> Sounds like it's the answer I'm gonna get. <laughs> Um, uh, Mark and then Kitty. I had George up here at some point, but did you back off? Oh. Okay, Mark. Well, I, I just had a question for, for Adam. I mean, as the secretary pointed out, about 80% of education spending is salaries and benefits. We have a statewide teacher's contract that's closed. We have the, the, date, the dates that schools can implement a reduction in force has passed. And teacher salaries have largely been set through contract negotiations. So um, are you suggesting that contracts be renegotiated with the with the teachers union during this during this time in order to come up with a different number because the school boards are going to have to the school we can, you can present something to the but to the voters but if the school board is unable to make substantial reductions in their budget what what is the point of going through that that exercise um, it seems like there's very very little money that school boards could cut from their FY21 budgets unless the teachers union is willing to come back in and completely start from scratch in terms of negotiating budgets for 21. Were you going to answer? No. I can. I can. Yeah. yeah, Dan, go ahead. Sorry. What is that for me? I guess so. Yeah, I don't. I don't know, Mark. I think the um, the dynamic would be, you know, once again to put the the information in front of the voters, and in my experience, that manifests itself sometimes with, um, you know, the board asking to reopen negotiations. So it would be a voluntary basis for them to pursue that locally. Uh, but but I why, think why would what? So why why would the teachers union agree to reopen those contracts at this point? Uh, to help sustain the viability of their system, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's. That's been my experience with other economic downturns that sometimes, you know, it, it has to be sorted out in the local context because the, the difficult choices are going to be, could be something to the extent of, you know, we've seen conversations in the last six months or so with communities where they've avoided making difficult decisions about closing a school. If the choice becomes closing a school to navigate a budget versus salary increases and once again, giving the voters that information to make those difficult choices, that's that's the nature of our system. And I don't I don't think we. Yeah, so I mean, just to once again, it gets to the point about making sure that voters locally have a full understanding of the context because they clearly. But, but again, what, what do the voters have to do with it? I mean, they can't go back in and change a contract. So no, but they can certainly, you know, the political process locally is to put political pressure on that dynamic and at least come comfortable locally to say, look, we're going to take 20, we're going to have a 20 cent increase in our tax rate because that's, we support the construct as it is and maybe this will get better. But, um, you know, I think that that political dynamic is, is powerful locally. I'm going to let Kitty ask a question. Go ahead. Um, sure. I apologize. I had to step off for a phone call. So if this has been addressed, I'll catch up later. I wanted to follow up with Sam's question. I'm just thinking of the logistics and, and what um, the administration has thought uh, through about logistically trying to get information out, voters voting on it. We're used to town meetings. We're used to going in when school boards are meeting. And if you don't have access to Zoom and you have a town meeting type group of several hundred people, all on a Zoom screen. Logistically, are we really going to hear the voice of voters in this, in this time that we're working in now with 
social distancing and, and trying to hold meetings remotely and getting questions answered. How would all this information get out to voters and how would we ensure that their voices are actually heard if we can hold a town meeting in the school gymnasium with three or 400 people? I just, I, and, and how would voting also happen because we haven't really come to an agreement with how voting is going to happen in the primary. Um, and so I just see a lot of unanswered questions and maybe decisions made by a handful of people and not truly by the voters that we keep hearing about. Yeah, I would, I would just argue that that's, that's typically the case anyway. But yeah, obviously the, um, you know, the details of doing this are, are pretty significant. Um, I think our point today was to, uh, in, to you know, as in the spirit of brainstorming to uh, bring the issue of spending onto the table, because I think we, you know, even acknowledging in the models that have been presented earlier, it still leaves us with a gap. And to think that there wouldn't be a spending uh, reconciliation somehow in this sector of our economy and our society where every other aspect of our society is learning how to navigate this, I think is unrealistic. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of alternatives, as Commissioner Gresham mentioned, uh, something could be done perhaps at the state level in terms of giving the commissioner authority to set us at spending amount um, if we if we dug into the complexity of doing that. But I think our point today was to put this on the table in the spirit of brainstorming to see if it would something be interested in working on. Uh, but our, our conclusion after lengthy analysis like yours is that we're at some point going to have to address the spending issue as much as we're, we're admiring the complexity of how the federal revenues might help us Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm just really concerned about yep. our, our democratic process and can we, with those large numbers, with so many school districts, really do that in the environment that we're living. Thank you. And, and I, what I'm hearing um, in those last comments are, going back to the question I was asking, is this really an effort to um, um, reduce spending at the school level or is it an effort to solve the problem and what I'm hearing I think in those last comments is that the administration at this point um, wants us to look at and wants us to set the stage so that voters um, can look at spending and um, and uh, spend less and, and please tell me if I'm wrong but that that's what I'm hearing um, so yeah we think it should be on the table as an option at this point. Well, said it, you know, um, basically saying whatever you did in March is now void and we want you to do it all over again is, I think, pretty much a guarantee that spending will get reduced. Well, you know, to your observation earlier, like if, if the federal government were to announce Tuesday, we'd have greater flexibility, right. you know, we wouldn't probably be looking at this, these kinds of solutions, but it's not clear to us how we're going to close that gap. Okay. Um, and we know... It's, it's a tricky needle of a thread because we know we're going to have new service requirements and from the system and particularly uh, for our most vulnerable students um, and their families at the same time uh, you know with the unemployment rates and you know these assumptions that somehow the revenues will continue to come in and so forth that uh, just uh, you know I think the, the broader contraction of many of these pieces of our infrastructure are going to have to be contemplated uh, George and then Scott uh, I appreciate putting this on the table um, in the um, spirit of looking at as many ideas and options as we can get. Um, I will, however, say that I am extraordinarily skeptical about, about the possibilities of this being even feasible. Between the fact that Mark brought up with 80% of the spending, I'll be being set in contracts already. The time frame that we are dealing with here for the 2021 budget, there is absolutely no way in my mind that we can get these things revoted, get contracts reopened and settled at a different rate that we have no idea when we will actually have good um, guidance from final guidance from the, the federalities. So all, all these things combined for me to say that, you know, uh, uh, thanks for the thoughts, but I, I just don't see any way, shape or form that we could actually do this successfully 
And I agree with Kate, it's going to add infinitely more chaos to our, our system than we have right now. Um, Scott. Yeah, I would um, just throw in here that um, whether the, the forecasted deficit this year is solved by CRF or borrowing or by an increased tax rate, um, regardless, districts are going to try to save every penny they can this year as a hedge against the December 1st tax letter in FY22. Yeah, that, that, I, and, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I was just yeah. going to say I appreciate that that thought, Representative Beck. You know, we we've been talking about that as well, not to try to look past the situation that we certainly have to address right now, but fiscal year 22 can be another very difficult discussion, right? If rates spike um, and and incomes are down, and that increases pressure on our uh, property tax credits, it will be another very very challenging year. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think Kate uh, touched on that earlier that the that the whole discussion that we're having about um, information voters having information and having a chance to actually use that information to set budgets is absolutely going to be true next year. Um, and so I think the question I have is does it make sense to um, force that decision right now in the current environment, um, or should we do the best we can with this year not fiscal 20, but do what we're going to do in fiscal 20, do um, something in 21 to protect property taxpayers, but also to protect schools, and then understand um, that the, the kind of debate that we're having right now about, um, about contracts and about budgets and so on are, are going to be on the table for voters in uh, next March, uh, no matter what. Oh. Uh, George, are you jumping back in? Yes other things. One, from the point of view of the school boards, asking them to do two more budgets um, is an incredible amount of work for the people on the school boards. Asking them to do a three-month budget and then a long budget. And, I, you know, I, you're asking volunteers to do uh, way more than they signed up for at that point. Because it really is substantial, having done that for 15 years. And they, I guess um, the the other thing is, I, I really agree and think we need to be looking at this as a a, a three year issue, 21, 22, 23, um, and not jump into something right now, which is likely not going to. Um, really solve any problems, but instead add additional problems. I think we need to be real cautious about not um, doing things too extreme too quickly uh, that end up being, instead of positive in the end, and end up being negative in the end. Anybody want to respond to that? Yeah. Peter, Anthony. Uh, just to point out um, that if, uh, and I basically agree with George to have a, a two or three year, uh, th two at least, probably three year glide path um, into the new world, so to say, I would, I would only add an overlay to the new world. We were poised in late February, early March, having heard the results of the study originally uh, encouraged by the education committee, but because it obviously bears on finances, we uh, had the pleasure of Dr. Colby coming in and showing us how uh, the present system had very little uh, logical uh, or policy support in the data. And uh, I think we conclu I concluded that as a, as a matter of fact, it probably was, the current system is probably subject to legal challenge, never mind the ethical uh, and equity moral issues behind it. I guess I would hope uh, if uh, following George, if there is a, a multi-year, uh, two, three, four um, transitional guide, uh, glide path into the new world, so to say, I really hope we also can incorporate transitioning 
to a uh, student waiting system that would be uh, in the future um, supported by data, which I gather, uh, I read the report correctly, the current system simply cannot be sustained by the evidence at hand. So I would hope a trajectory, given the upsetness that we didn't invite, but we have anyway, that we incorporated some sort of trajectory to write a situation which, uh, according to the academics, is indefensible. Thank you. Uh, other comments anyone has? Uh, George. Sorry to speak so much, but I also just want to say that we're live streaming on uh, on YouTube to maybe a number of constituents. And I want to be clear that the Ways and Means Committee of the House in no way is going to endorse a 20 cent increase in the property tax rates. We have been very clear about that. And I don't want to present people that kind of, of false idea of, of how we're approaching this. Thank you, George. Um, we have been really clear and it's worth emphasizing again, sort of the two um, parameters that we've been working on is that um, property taxpayer, the, the increase in property taxpayers should be based on, um, on the pre-COVID, the pre-pandemic world. Um, and that's what our committee has endorsed. Um, we talked last Wednesday a little bit about, um, or Tuesday, about moving a bill that would do just that and leave the 21 problem for a separate bill, um, uh, partly to make it clear that the solution to 21 isn't gonna be increased property taxes. We're not sure what it's gonna be, but it isn't gonna be increased property taxes. And the other thing um, that we've talked about um, in the committee, uh, and, and maybe maybe with less, um, I don't know if there's been quite the same consensus on it. So I'll speak for myself. The other thing I've talked about um, is uh, ensuring that schools have sufficient money um, to manage what we know is going to be a very uh, difficult situation. Um, we you know we know that kids are going to come back in the fall if schools open in the fall, um, having uh, lost significant um, time this school year. Uh, with challenges over the summer. We, don't, we know that the um, challenges in teaching remotely are just, we're just learning what they are, just beginning to explore what they are. And for me anyway, to talk about something which may leave schools with insufficient resources to do the job that we've asked them to do is just unacceptable. Anyone else wanna jump in? Yeah, if I could just follow up on that, I think, you know, you're right. I think that's what makes the use of the ESSER funds relative to CRF so um, fraught with risk because we're not sure how those funds can be applied because they're the, the flexibility of ESSER is significantly greater than CRF and there's different timelines involved. But I would also, to your point about the continuity of learning, um, this is a brave new world uh, for our schools and it's, it's not going to end at the end of the school year. And there's, um, we've relied on the partnership of um, all the stakeholders, the teachers union, the administrators and so forth to navigate the, the first phases of this crisis. Um, <clears throat> but there's gonna be interest in looking at issues of working conditions, for example, particularly as we aim towards the fall. Um, and a better part of those master agreements are um, language around the working, defining a working day and so forth and the conditions upon which educators engage in that work. So. There's a lot of a lot of variables that have to be reconciled as part of uh, the near future, and um, the financial element is certainly just one of it, one aspect of it. Uh, good. Any other um, anything else anybody wants to put on the table? It's a tough discussion. You know, every year we talk about education finance, and it's a difficult discussion. And this year, um, it's. Uh, multiples of difficult. Um, and I appreciate the um, members of the administration uh, participating in the discussion and um, you know being willing to put ideas out there and get questions and question the ideas that we've got um, because that's the only way we're gonna get to the end of this. Um, Jim. You're muted. Yeah, part. Um... Apologize for my absence in the last little bit. I had to go to another committee, which I did. Um, but here now I'm back. <laughs> so 
I'll try to catch up on the last, whatever it's been, 15 or 20 minutes or something, which I think was probably very important, but I had to be in um, Sarah's committee for a little bit. So I'm back. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? If anything? Um, so for the committee, um, I think the question I have for us is um, of the work that Mark has been doing. I wanna go back to the proposal that Mark put on the table. Um, and where's Mark, is he here? Yeah, he's still here. Um, I, I sort of cut off the discussion because I wanted to be sure that we had a chance to hear from uh, the administration. Um, but I wanna go back to that and see if people have questions, um, comments about it, ideas, uh, things that they would find it helpful if Mark and uh, Chloe did some addition and, and Bill Talbot, who's with us, did, and Chloe, uh, Chloe I already mentioned, um, did some additional work. Um, I don't know if I can dial us back to where we were when we shifted gears, but that's what I'm trying to do. So Mark, you wanna get it up there uh, again and... Um, Sorsha, Sorsha, can you pop it up? Yeah, we'll take a couple more minutes here just to um, see where we are. So does, does anybody have any questions that I can? I think Scott does. I don't know if it's a question about this or not, but Scott, go ahead. Yeah, hey, Mark, uh, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. So if we did, I'm looking at the fourth column here, if we did oh, this proposal, we'd still be looking at a $69.5 million deficit? No, this is just this is just an example. So you know, we had to, we had to just pick some parameters to plug in. But, um, you know, you could reduce the education payment more if we were confident that we could restore more of that money from CRF funds. And we've also, there's also a decision point down on the stabilization reserve, whether or not you leave any money in there at all. I think in this particular run, Chloe left uh, 2%, which is $15 million in there. So that money could potentially be used, but no, this, this third column is the fourth column is it's just an example of how we could do this. Um, the parameters are, there's, there's a number of parameters that you could play with. Um, so that's okay, 60, that $69 million is just, it's arbitrary. Well, it also, um, if we uh, claw back the 27 million, which we've talked about, I'd be interested in hearing what committee members think about it. Um, that reduces that 69 million, a, a chunk of it fairly quickly. Is that right, Mark? Yeah, I think that's right. And the, 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 the 27 is what we think is left over after AOE takes out the 10%. Right. But um, I'm also aware now that um, private schools may be eligible for some of that money. And so okay. I haven't gotten down to that okay. level yet to figure out how much might get siphoned off. But it's it, it's still a significant chunk of- It's of a significant chunk of money and it can be used, yeah. I think, for pretty much anything. Yep. Yeah, so the so the question that we were talking about the other day was to, and I, I, think, I think we ended up um, sort of in agreement, was to ask the agency of, of education not to push that money out until we've had a chance to talk through um, whether how it gets, um, how, how it is used to adjust um, the education payments. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we will not be sending yeah. this out until yeah, that, we have clarity. That was sure. my thought. So, so that money is at least set aside for the moment so that we can, um, we can continue to, because it is more flexible money. And um, so it is money that we can net against education payments maybe more easily than CRF. Yeah. Uh, Robin. Thanks. Um, and thank you, Mark, for, you know, laying out all these different options and what the variables are. Um, I mean, uh, to me, this, and, and I like that, that final column as a, as a concept. Our big question is what's actually going to be eligible and when are we going to know it? <laughs> yes. So, you know, and then, so that means sort of how long do we have to wait before we have to decide on these things? I, I don't know. Usually tax rates are set before June 30th so that all the machinery involved in getting tax bills out to people um, is done. But again, just, just to, um, for clarification on the other point, one, one of the thoughts we had on this is that you may not need to know in advance how, you know, we need an idea, but we don't have to know to the down to the dollar 
yeah. how much money schools have that may be eligible. It may be that some districts don't have enough to, to recoup all of that money. And again, that would put them in a situation where they may would have to use existing reserves, find savings in their own in their past budget, or carry a deficit forward into the next year. When we had a conversation um, yesterday or the day before with the superintendents, some of them indicated that they have some reserves in place that could deal with some of this stuff. So, um, you know, every year the, the budget's an estimate, and at the end of the year you figure out how much you spent. And some years schools have surpluses, some years they have deficits. So it would be one way to address it. I think you'd want to be confident that most of the money that we claw back could be replaced with CRF money. So you're not hurting the schools, but I don't think it has to be down to the penny. And I don't think we have to have all that work done in advance. Right. Well, I, and I certainly don't expect it to be down to the penny, but I am concerned that uh, just as, as in the general fund and everything that we're doing, because we don't know what's actually going to be eligible, we are taking the risk that there's going to be you know, a, a bigger deficit than we thought or um, put people in a, in a worse position that we, and we don't want to do that either. So that right. those are just, and, I know we don't have the answers yet, but that's, that's clearly the huge risk with doing it the way we're doing it. Right. And the, the other risk is what, what the secretary raised is that, you know, we, it, it, this, this deficit in the education fund is looking at existing budgets. If, if they're spending the districts, and I think there, there are expenses that they're having are above their budget at this point, that's going to eat into that $27 million because, and, and I don't know how much at this point, but um, in order to solve the $167 million shortfall in the education fund, we'd have to identify money in existing budgets, past budgets that are eligible for right. this kind of funding. So there's this two, two different piles. And that's why I wanted to keep on the presentation, I wanted to keep the the ESSER money and the CRF money separately right. because it, it gives you some flexibility there. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for all your work. You're welcome. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the one bit of information that we'll have um, Tuesday is better, uh, it is an updated um, consensus forecast, right? It's going to be consensus. Mm -hmm. Mark? Um, um, yeah. that, that's, that's my understanding, yes, on Tuesday. Yeah. So. Um, so that, that'll be useful. Hopefully it's it's not worse news. Hopefully it's slightly better news, but whatever it is, it'll be useful that it's a little a little more fixed and that it's a little more current. Um, right. And, you know, we continue to hear what we hear from Congress, which is not a lot, um, and from the Treasury, which is not, not been terribly helpful. But um, at the same time, we if we wait for certainty, um, well, nothing will happen. So. Right, and uh, one, one other thing just occurred to me, if I could just jump back in for a sec. Yeah. Uh, the distinction between the, the, the CRF money and the, and the ESSER money, it seems to me that the new expenses that are different, the districts are incurring as a result of COVID-19 right now would likely be eligible for the CRF money because they're directly related to the CRF. So you could possibly use all of the ESSER money that's available for the purposes of backfilling the reduction in the education payment. Um, Jim, Maslin. Um, thank you, Mark. This last few sentences in particular were helpful. I like this, um, the proposal that you put on the table earlier this morning, and I would say it was not at all encouraged by um, Adam Gresham's testimony, particularly where he seemed to be going. And I was a little concerned about Dan French's testimony too. So um, I thought I heard a movement towards encumbering some money that I thought maybe should rightly go to education. So uh, we'll just have to see how this sorts out. Um, and, um, and I missed a few minutes, as I said, maybe not as long as I thought, um, but um, I like the proposal and I certainly would want to work to see how we could make something that like that or similar to that work. Um. So other committee members, um, are Kate or Kitty, uh, Larry, want to jump in, um, or anyone for that matter. Um, doesn't look like it. Um, so question for the committee. Um, do you want Mark to continue to work on this um, idea? And um, what... 
uh, let's see, so we're gonna have the updated forecast on Tuesday. We're meeting again on Tuesday. I guess we can probably hear that on Tuesday and, um, and continue to work in this direction. Um, the other thing I wanna say that if there are other ways of putting federal money into the education fund or into this big system, whether it goes directly to schools or however we do it, um, we will explore them. Um, this is the, the, the best outcome for, uh, for Vermont taxpayers and for kids is to get as much federal money into the system as we can. Um, so that's, at least for this year, that's, um, that's um, probably uh, the best outcome that we can hope for. So, uh, Kate. I just want to say that I really appreciate that this has uh, multiple uh, resources to solve a very complex problem, and it's not just looking at one way of solving this, such as as uh, tax rates. So I, I appreciate this, and I'm I'm very interested in uh, seeing where you go and continuing this conversation, and also bringing it to uh, the education committee as well. Great. Anything else anyone has? We've we done enough at finance for one morning. So, okay. Uh, so I will see everybody uh, tomorrow on the House floor and um, Tuesday in committee. Great. Thank All right. you. I will end the live stream now. Thanks. Thanks.